I don't think this is just ordinary diesel oil, Scully. I think it's, uh, I think it's a medium. A medium being used by some kind of alien creature that uses it to body jump. I think season three, you can look at that and say, almost across the board, that it was a completely entertaining and quality season. And that a lot of that had to do with uh, how hard that Frank Spotness worked on the show, how hard Howard Gordon worked on the show, that we had Darren Morgan on the show, and he added just a flavor to the show that um, showed the range of not just the, the kinds of stories you could tell, but of the actors and that how good they were. It was a show that was growing and at that point had kind of realized what it could be. And even though it be could become even more, I think at that point it become a complete show. And that's why I think season three um, is uh, for me the best, the best season of all. First time, we saw the enemy that was killing us. The black oil was an alien creature that invaded uh, your body through your eyes or your nose or your mouth and would take over your self and control you and then when it was done with you, it would move on. The trick was always to find these graphic representations of possession, being possessed, of being abducted, of, of being not who you are. Later in the series, we discovered that it's in primitive fossils. It's also uh, found in meteorites that have been found on Earth. The oil in the eyes, well, obviously we couldn't do it for, for real, so we had to uh, come up with some kind of uh, uh, composite shot that uh, Matt Beck at the time was doing the visual effects so that Matt could lay into people's, over people's eyes. We put them digitally on the surface of the cornea. And we actually move them in such a way that, you know, it's like, you know the sense you get with floaters in your eye, how they kind of move this way and then they stop and they kind of drift back the other way. We actually made the oil goop move that way. So when he or she blinked, it would follow the blink and then keep going, you know, with a lag in it as if it's really a liquid, it's really a fluid. We went through oh boy, hundreds of tests of trying to find the two uh, types of fluids that we could put together and Matt could then overlay over people's eyes and I remember us coming up with a with a black oil mixed in with uh, uh, acetone I believe what gave it the best globular look and we got it to float by the lens several hundred times until Matt thought that he had had enough of it <laughs> and then he took it away and lo and behold the next time I saw it it was over top of somebody's eyes on uh, in the show.
as the mythology grew, the oil grew with it. The oil then, if it stays in you, it can gestate into the alien from the movie. And then the alien from the movie can then become a gray. The conspirators, the elders, basically tried to develop a vaccine to stop it. Some of them did. So, so did the Russians in Tunguska and Terma. They were working on their own vaccine to try to stop this invasive oil, the faceless aliens. The reason why they made themselves faceless was to prevent this from getting in to their bodies. So the faceless aliens, which are the bounty hunters, basically, the idea being that this black oil is spreading around the universe, subjugating races of aliens, including us, including human beings, and eventually going to rule the universe. There was a two-parter called Piper Maru and Apocrypha, which I had gone to a convention in Minneapolis, an X-Files convention, and a fan had asked about the effect that Scully's sister's death was having on her. And it occurred to me that we had not dealt with that. And so I'll, literally on the plane ride back, I came up with almost the entire story. By the time I, the plane landed in Los Angeles, which was probably the fastest that anything ever happened on, for me on that show. That was sort of the demands of the characters, dealing with the emotional baggage that the character was carrying around. A dive team is down looking for a specific P-51 Mustang. And they're scanning across the fuselage of the plane, and then they read the serial number on the plane and then they go up to the cockpit and then the pilot jumps out and he's against the glass. And that was me. I asked, I asked Rob, hey, hey, could I do that stunt? I think I could do that. That, that sounds really cool. And, he said, well, geez, you know, I don't know, I don't know. He said, we'll have to talk to Chris. And so he talked to Chris, and Chris said, yeah, and they both came out to the bus because it was on the tech survey day and said, you know, you're going to have to cut your hair. And back then I had quite long hair. And I said, that's okay, I don't care, I'll do it. For me, that was it sort of all came together because uh, I don't know how many hours we spent together uh, either uh, agreeing, disagreeing, or, or blowing things up. As he built it, I would burn it down or blow it, blow it up. So we spent many hours together uh, putting whatever Chris wanted together together. So it was nice to see him on screen and the black oil in his eyes it sort of completed the whole thing for me. My favorite black oil moment still, even after years of black oil, is in Piper Maru when Krychek goes into the men's room at the airport, looks down, sees a pair of women's shoes, and looks up, and there's Mrs., I believe her name was Mrs. Godier, uh, who has been taking over the oil. The oil leaves her and goes into him, but it's just a great scene, and, and Nick Lee was terrific in that. So Krychek walks out. It was written as they walk out of frame or something, and it, it was kind of hard, because it just exists in the eyes, the oil. It's the only place we've shown that it, it's visible. And I remember calling down to Chris or Frank and saying, I, I think I need to shoot this differently. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have the last image of the episode be, one, I think it's good, but I think it's, it'll help see the oil, is have Krychek walk right completely into lens and, and go to black. Feel better? Looks like a new man. I think the next day they saw the dailies and, and dug it, but it was one of those where it seems like when I watch the shot, well, of course, that's the only way you could do it, when it was instead on the set, standing there scratching my chin, thinking, uh, what am I going to do to make the end of the episode not suck? There was this huge silo and, and we had poor Nick Lee on top on his knees and we had this 
rubber face on him and these tubes and all this oil draining out of his face. And I thought, well, I've arrived. I mean, no, it, it can't get any tougher than this, but it did. <laughs> So he's got a strap-on version of his own face over top of his own face uh, with all these tubes running in that are just like we had the eyes were out of it they were just kind of filling up with these uh, walls of black oil ooze and dripping down into this alien who's kind of escaping a couple of times the pressure would be too much and cry check would go like this at the same time as the special effects guy pushing his plunger and the special effects guy would get a little bit nervous and the stuff would just come shooting out so fast that, you know, it was just like everyone's laughing and just going, this is not what Chris is going to want. And then we had the 1013 on the door, and that was my kind of my first introduction to the little notes and secrets that Chris and Frank would build into the show. What are we doing here, Mulder? June 30th, 1908. Tungus tribesmen and Russian fur traders look up into the southeastern Siberian sky and see a fireball streaking to Earth. When it hit the atmosphere, it created a series of cataclysmic explosions that are considered to be the largest single cosmic event in the history of civilization. 2,000 times the force of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. What was it? It's been speculated that it was a piece of a comet, or an asteroid, or even a piece of antimatter. Tunguska and Terma really came about by once again trying to find a big, fun canvas uh, which to tell stories. And so we wanted to do a gulag story. And so that led to the idea of the Russians were experimenting separately with us on a vaccine for the black oil. So it was sort of an arms race. It just seemed natural that there would have been an alien invasion find the cure race between us and the Soviet Union. We got to have Mulder in a gulag, we got to have the, the men on horseback, we got to have him and, and Krychek breaking in, so there's a lot of sort of action adventure stuff that we were, were really looking forward to doing. One of the big sets we made look like it was in Russia was the prison, the exterior prison. It's basically a ranger station in the middle of Stanley Park, which is, you know, just a couple of trees away from downtown Vancouver. We brought in, I think, 50 or 60 truckloads of dirt. You just create the atmosphere of being far away. You put a title under there, it says Tunguska, Russia. You're more making sure you don't give them reasons to disbelieve it than to believe it. You know, you got the Russians, you got the horse, you got the prison, you got all the stuff. What's in the shot that could spoil it? Remove those things. He'd read these things, but it never really got to David that this was not going to be the most comfortable acting moment of your career until he got there. And then once he realized what was going to be involved, it was kind of a, oh, uh, walking on thin ice, I think they call it. It was tough. <laughs> In X-Files fashion, we just start applying the idea for that individual mythology episode to the mythology itself and what pieces can we take and who would be involved. And that's why Krychek is perfect for that. Oh, Krychek has a Russian name. Well, is that by accident or is that a happy accident? And, 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 and uh, you know, to be honest, it, there, it was a happy accident. I just want to congratulate you, товарищ. I always love Krychek. He swims with the waters, and sometimes he swims against them, and you can never quite trust him, but you you kind of like him. Krychek. Alex Krychek. Skinner didn't say anything about taking on a partner. It wasn't Skinner. Actually, I opened the file two hours before your request, so technically it's, it's my case. They really wanted to try to cast a local actor. We looked at a lot of actors from across Canada, and there was an actor that they really they loved his look, Nicholas Lee. No one knew how important that character is going to be. So it really was a, a factor of Nick Lee's taking on the part, embodying the part, and it being an interesting character in the end and a uh, foil for Mulder and Scully and a person who was playing uh, always both sides of the field. I don't think we ever intended for him to last as long as he lasted, but we couldn't bear to part with him.
So he kept finding ways to bring him back, and he really was the cat with nine lives because he should have died over and over again. He should have been blown up. He was infected with black oil. He had his arm cut off, but he kept coming back. You look back and you see how that character changed and grew, and it, it's fascinating. I mean, and Nick did a wonderful job with it. One of the pleasures as a writer of working on X-Files is we had quite a palette to work with and there were a lot of recurring characters who we were free to use as long as they didn't damage the ongoing story and the mythology. You're a damn schoolboy, Mulder. You have no idea. No idea. Yeah. Okay, then tell me. Tell me. I used to be you. I was where you are now. But you're not me, Mulder. I don't think you have the heart. The storytelling function of Informant was critical to these mythology episodes, so the character of X, played by Stephen Williams, was introduced. But there comes a point with a character like that where you feel like you've run your course, like that dynamic has, you've done as much with it as you can. And so with great reluctance, we terminated X and brought in a new Informant. Uh, and very memorably, he dies, you know, writing the initials of her job title in blood uh, on the floor of Mulder's apartment building. He was replaced by Marita Covarrubias, and then eventually she, too, found her way out of the series. Mr. Mulder, my name is Marita Covarrubias. I'm the assistant to the special representative. I think the supporting characters in the, in the mythology consistently played a great role in making the mythology cohesive. It was neat with the lone gunman because they were an important part of the story and they always helped Mulder and, and, and continued the plots along. These guys are like an extreme government watchdog group. They publish a magazine called The Lone Gunman. Some of their information is first rate, covert actions, classified weapons. Some of their ideas are downright spooky. Vladimir Zhirinovsky, leader of the Russian Social Democrats. He's being put into power by the most heinous and evil force of the 20th century. Barney? <laughs> the CIA. What? Is this your skeptical partner? She's hot. You know, we've always looked at ourselves and sort of described ourselves as an information conduit. We were the, we were the ones that were living out on the edge and knew how to get a hold of certain pieces of information or, or knew where to find them or knew how to go about finding them in order to facilitate either Mulder's or Scully's needs in uh, their searches. Those three were perfectly cast and they were all very responsible, the three actors, uh, Dean, Bruce and Tom, were very responsible about having an emotional life that fit their visual take. We were kind of a, a mouthpiece as in the form of an explanation for the audience in terms of, of, well, if you didn't understand what was going on in the script at this point, here's what's happening. And then they go on to the rest of the show. They, you know, get rid of us and go on to the rest of the show. We did that quite a bit. But on the whole, we simply facilitated uh, Mulder and Scully's needs and brought, a, I guess, a certain, a certain sense of humor to the show, which I think is something that the fans kind of locked in on. They enjoyed that element of it. Good work sneaking out these charts. Talk to me in my pants. There's plenty of room down there. You look down, Mulder. Tell you what, you're welcome to come over Saturday night. We're all hopping on the internet to nitpick the scientific inaccuracies of Earth 2. I'm doing my laundry. We didn't want to go a full gimbal route. We wanted to really be able to create uh, turbulence in its real form. And uh, I don't know, I know we've all been on certain flights that we don't want to remember where we were clenching our teeth because the plane was doing all kinds of things we didn't think it was meant to do. So we thought of different ways and we ended up making a hydraulic unit that was essentially a, a teeter-totter and some sideways movement, but we did it rather rapidly and we were able to shake that thing and we could have shaken it apart and we had lots of power. We shot the mid-air abduction, it took us four days. And we had handheld cameras in the, in the cockpit the operators had to have helmets on, 
because the plane was so violently moving. <laughs> it was shaking so bad we couldn't keep focused on the monitor. Cut, cut, cut. Okay, I gotta get off this thing. <laughs> so we had to get off the plane to at least be able to look at the monitor without having it shake so much. And the camera guys were amazing because when they're handheld, they're trying to hold on. Meanwhile, the plane's shaking and the actors are moving and the focus pullers are going, oh, geez, here we go. And it, But it looked amazing. Within two hours, I had made 12 people violently ill. Uh, we had to exchange at least a dozen extras. The biggest thing there was the physical effect of pulling somebody out the window. That was really quite tricky because getting the exact angle to make sure that when you yank this person out, they're not gonna be banging up against anything else or you know their seat as they're getting pulled out of their chair. So that one was really carefully designed and I thought uh, Dave Gochi and Grave Murray, the way they worked together on coordinating that was brilliant. I think that's one sequence that I'm proudest of, all the X-Files that I directed. That sequence just worked out beautifully. Research on a crash site was difficult because it's so catastrophic uh, what occurs and um, you know we met with an NTSB guy and he gave us all the details and and Graham wanted it to feel like we had just accidentally photographed a crash site he didn't want it to look like a movie set at all. Well, I remember the tail section uh, we found somewhere in South Carolina and we had to we had to ship it in. I mean luggage and dolls and clothes everywhere. I mean, it's an explosion. And for it not to be in the trees or everywhere would have been untrue. And then it was also painting and burning this old abandoned field black. And I remember being in the chopper flying over shooting it. And we started back a couple of miles and came upon it and it looked like news footage. Probably one of my biggest single sets uh, between, you know, uh, construction, paint, greens and set deck, we probably created a 30 to 40 acre set. There was an Air Canada pilot who came by to look because he had flown the Vancouver to Los Angeles route and he had flown over top of it and he couldn't believe what he saw and he thought when did this happen and why don't I know about it. So he came down that night to investigate just to see what was up so it was fun talking to him. He said it looked like a real plane crash. That episode, having that aside, was was the biggest episode I'd directed uh, to date. And it, again, we're at an airport, and we're underwater, and we got tanks and hangars with the rebuilt plane. And it was so fun at that time because it was, we were just making movies that were running on television. You know, we had Mulder and Skelly driving underneath the DC-6 and it took two nights. Out at Abbotsford Airport, we had uh, it was a record, I know this. We had 13 generators, 75 4K PAR lights that raked the runway, four Condors, uh, two Muscos. We lit up 3,500 feet of a runway at night and really had a DC-6 come in and land. I mean, it was the most generators ever used on anything in Vancouver history. And we were making a TV show. Look out your window, Agent Mulder. You see the lights? Now imagine if one of those lights flickered off, you'd hardly notice, would you? I like to try to put in, and we all do, little homages to things that we inspired us. There's one in Max, I believe the character's name was Garrett, who was sort of the bad guy that Mulder encounters on the airplane. I was asked to write a speech for him early on in the process, and I just remembered the third man. And I remembered that great speech that Orson Welles has that, uh, Graham Greene wrote, or some say Orson Welles wrote it, but um, where he's up in the Ferris wheel and he says, look at those uh, dots down there, they're people, but look at those dots and would you really cry if one or two of those dots just stopped moving, you know, to hold the justification for the, the, the immorality of what he's doing. And um, it just hit me, oh, here's my chance to finally do that scene. Is it worth sacrificing the future, the lives of millions, to keep a few lights on? I was pleased I got to give that little nod to one of my personal, you know, inspirations. Thanks for coming down to do this.
Hit him? Yeah. Gethsemane, to me, was a, a very important episode, not just because it had probably the best cliffhanger of all, which was Mulder's apparent suicide, which incidentally we really tried to torture the audience because normally we would say to be continued and we didn't do that. There was no to be continued and you just had to wonder was at the end of the show and some people at the uh, network and studio were very concerned about that, that we were going to lose viewers who would think the show was over because Mulder had killed himself. The detective asked me he needed me to identify a body. I think the moment itself is great, particularly because it's it's on Scully's face when we learn the news, and she's hearing it uh, in the with the FBI, and nobody can sell a moment like that better than Jillian. I mean, you just you know, even if in the back of your mind you're saying no, they can't do that, you can't help but a little tear come to your eye. Agent Mulder died late last night from an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. What I especially loved about that episode, aside from the production value of shooting in a frozen set for the cave where they were digging out this supposed um, alien corpse, was this idea about religion. Because what became increasingly clear to Chris and me in years of working on these mythology episodes was that Mulder's quest for extraterrestrial life was akin to trying to prove God existed. And there's this wonderful scene in that episode with him and Scully on the stairs where he says, come on, if you could prove God exists, wouldn't you? And she says, no, I take it on faith, which is so profound and correct. That is what religion is about. You must take it on faith. God is not going to prove it to you. If someone could prove to you the existence of God, would it change you? Only if it had been disproven. Then you accept the possibility that belief in God is a lie? I don't think about it, actually. And I don't think that it can be proven. But what if it could be? Wouldn't that knowledge be worth seeking? Or is it just easier to go on believing the lie? I can't go with you, Mulder. At times like that when the mythology really became exciting. of the following year when, when we came back and did the two-parter, Redux 1 and 2. What I think worked and what justified and allowed us to get away with that was Scully was in on it, number one. We didn't cheat Scully, and so by not cheating Scully, ultimately I think the audience uh, forgives you for that because you get to see what happened, you get to see why she did what she did, you get to see why Mulder did what he did. I don't think it was a cheap shot is what I'm saying. I think it was a really sound thing to do and, and it made for a great moment. Redux and Redux 2 were very successful, I think, especially Redux 2, which has this lovely um, threesome of uh, ideas. You know, is it medical treatment? Is it religious faith? Or is it the chip that the cigarette smoking man produces that ultimately leads to the remission of Scully's cancer? You don't know. And I, and I loved the the competition that those three ideas had in that story. It sort of takes the idea of the show and it, it just spins it in the most interesting way. We would always plot stories with one or two or three options for the audience to chew on. Scully's cancer has gone into remission. We never show the audience something that was definitive in situations like that, which kept not only kept the mystery going, um, which, uh, you know, ironically is how the real world is. You read the newspaper and it's subject to interpretation. That's also the episode that leads to Mulder's loss of faith for the entire season, which is something that even though we kept playing it again and again in the mythology episodes that year, people could not accept that Mulder had really <laughs> lost his faith in aliens, that the Great Smoking Man had shaken him. That's what we'd done in those two episodes with some success. That was probably the last season where we could simply do chapters without starting to attack the heart of what the mythology was about.
These files include the same kind of radiation phenomena. Tissue destroyed by exposure to... Black oil. Five years ago, you and Agent Scully investigated the case of a World War II plane salvaged from the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, where a substance was brought to the surface, which you describe as a highly contagious virus of extraterrestrial origin that has radioactive properties and can take over a man's body and is part of an alien conspiracy to colonize the planet, if I'm not mistaken. And you'd love to help, but you left your lightsaber at home. How'd you get stuck down here, Agent Doggett? Kirsch catch you peeing in his cornflakes? What's great just from a visual standpoint with the, the black oil, it's a great effect. It's not that difficult to do, and it allowed us to uh, play the, the sort of classic body snatchers question mark of uh, who do I trust? Have you been taken over or not? Because you can't tell except in opportune moments when your eyes go black with this stuff in you. And then when it's done with you, you get a great scene where somebody has to spit it out of all their orifices, which is always nice. Oh, my God.